All right, hello everyone. We'll be getting started in just a moment here. We wanna give a few minutes um, for the rest of our attendees to join. All right, I think we can get started now. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening for some others. Um, welcome to the first event in our new series um, that's being hosted by the Harvard Global Health Institute and Harvard's um, Center for Ethics. Um, this is a, my name is Daisy Winner, and I oversee the Harvard Global Health Institute's work on our systems of oppression portfolio. Um, so from the beginning of COVID, um, we've known that prisons, jails, and detention centers around the world have become reservoirs for virus transmission, filled with individuals with increased prevalence of pre-existing conditions in unavoidably co close contact, in facilities that are often poorly ventilated and unsanitary and are existing with inadequate access to health care. Um, so as a result, these places have become hotbeds for the virus. Um, in light of this, Harvard Global Health Institute and the Center for Ethics um, have put together this series to examine the alarming reality of COVID-19 that continues to ravage places of incarceration and place those inside at disproportionate risk. The series um, hopes to bring to the forefront the plight of people who are entangled in the criminal justice system, who are really frequently left out of public health interventions, and whose health is also largely disregarded in criminal justice policies. The series um, will bring together activists and experts from around the world to discuss COVID, how COVID has revealed the brutality of incarceration, and how penal systems strip individuals of their rights, uphold pre-existing social and economic inequities and directly harm the health of people who are incarcerated, their families and the communities surrounding them. This first webinar, COVID-19 in prison, jails and detention centers, the historical perspective and global context will examine the current state of COVID-19 in places of incarceration and detention by discussing the history and context for the present day carceral practices and conditions that have helped spread the virus. In discussing this background, we can learn about the inequality foundational to incarceration, which serves to threaten the health of people who are incarcerated and thwarts efforts to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so before we get started, I have just a few notes. Um, we are using Zoom to stream this video and record, the recording will be made available on the HGHI YouTube page. Afterwards, um, we'll also be running a live Q&A towards the end of the discussion. Um, and so at the bottom of your screen, please use the Q&A function to ask questions um, and we'll discuss them at the end. Um, we have also enabled a chat function, which is gonna be monitored and overseen by my colleague, Ellie. Um, so when using this function, please make sure to set your message recipient to everyone, not just the panelists. Um, and we wanted to invite all of our participants to use the chat um, to just let us know where you're connecting from today. So I'm actually calling from, from Boston. Um, with that being said, I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, so our keynote speaker today is Bruce Riley, who is the deputy director of the Voice of the Experience, which is a grassroots organization founded and run by formerly incarcerated people, their families and their allies dedicated to restoring the full human and civil rights of those impacted by the criminal injustice system. 
He's also the deputy director of Voters Organized to Educate and a founding member of the formerly incarcerated Convicted People and Families Movement. Bruce served as a jailhouse lawyer for 12 years before his parole and then leaving prison to put his knowledge to work by joining Direct Action for Rights and Equality in 2005 and played a vital role in passing significant criminal justice reforms such as the restoration of voting rights, eliminate, eliminating mandatory minimums, statewide ban the box, the Good Samaritan Overdose Prevention Act, unshackling incarcerated pregnant women and the probation violation reform. In 2011, Bruce moved to New Orleans where he teamed up with Voice of the Experience and enrolled in Tulane Law School despite the fact that he didn't have an undergraduate degree. Um, after graduating in 2004, Bruce co-founded Transcending Through Education Foundation with two friends who had also entered prison at a young age and earned law degrees after being released. Bruce has written his own blog called Unprisoned since 2010, where he provides expert analysis on discrimination in employment, housing, and voting rights. He's also the author of Communities, Evictions, and Criminal Convictions, a foundational report on public housing, and the racial history of felon disenfranchisement in Louisiana, which served as a key voting block to vote v. Louisiana and the reenfranchisement of 40,000 people, including himself. Bruce serves on the board of All Square, a re-entry restaurant program in Minneapolis, the National Clean Slate Clearinghouse Advisory Committee, the Steering Committees for the Unanimous Jury Coalition, Louisianans for Prison Alternatives, Power Coalition, and the IRB for American Institutes of Research, and is also on the advisory board for the Prison Policy Initiative. Bruce is currently a Robert Ward Johnson Foundation interdisciplinary research leader and has also worked as an artist, a lighting designer, a DJ, and a theater director. Um, so with that, I'll let Bruce take it from here. All righty. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, and thanks everybody for, for having me here. Uh, I'm so blessed and uh, fortunate to be able to speak with you all. I know there's a uh, a, a pretty good range of people. I can even see some some names that I know from, from various walks of life uh, here on the attendee list. And so uh, I'm, I'm super grateful that I can kind of kick off this conversation with a few things. Uh, and my, my desire is to maybe tell you something you didn't know, to stoke a, a few questions and to maybe, you know, inspire you a little bit to continue on a certain type of path that you may be deep along or just starting out in terms of public health and incarceration and, and all those intersections. Um, so what I want to do is, is kind of give you a, a little bit of sense of, of why the prison pandemic was inevitable. Um, maybe a, a little few details about it and then a little bit about sort of where we are and, and where we might be able to get to. So first, um, you know, we have to consider that, you know, mass incarceration in this, this nation is um, it's a whole thing that no, no one could ever have anticipated, uh, planned ahead. It's new relatively in the, in the course of, of human history. And we do it in America, you know, just like uh, nobody else can. So we got Ford trucks and we got mass incarceration and nobody can really match that. Um, but consider the, the first realm, uh, you know, the first stage of mass incarceration was, you know, in the, the colonial times, particularly with the Revolutionary War. And the motivation of not just giving people swift, brutal punishments at that point in time was to you know, maybe make prisoner exchanges because everyone has an interest in maybe getting their guys back and we'll trade your guys. And so the prison brig, the ship, you know, full of folks, as one could guess, uh, you know, became hotbeds of disease and not many people survived. Uh, and similar to, you know, folks coming to America or, or people being shipped from England to Australia. You know these these ships, uh, you know, are, are are not designed for people to to survive uh, in such close quarters, including folks being enslaved and taken from Africa and brought to America. Uh, I think people are, are pretty familiar with with the idea that that this is not a healthy condition and there's death and disease everywhere. So we fast forward into the post Civil War era when suddenly we have a new sense of equality in America, uh, a new stage of, of voting rights, citizenship, and then mass incarceration too at that point became the round them up and enslave them model. Under the 13th Amendment, you could still enslave somebody as long as they were convicted of a crime. 
And so the convict leasing system really kicked off. And that's when sheriffs and chain gangs became a, a real thing. Uh, and huge work crews and massive public projects became a, a, you know, an incentive to round people up. Uh, not to go off on too much of a tangent there, but there's a, a lot of things that I would encourage every American to learn because that era is really foundational into how we can end up with the prison gulag system we have across the country at this time. Now, the, the labor movement, you know, post-World War II started to really cut into the chain gangs and they're, you know, they're taking on big public projects. Uh, but at around the same time, the civil rights movement was cutting into this sort of King's Dungeon model. And we started getting a few standards uh, evolving around jails and prisons. And a lot of that came from some amazing civil rights movement lawyers, uh, but even more so came from the jailhouse lawyers on the inside, people like Fred Cruz in Texas, uh, who were advocating conditions and, and how people were treated. And so that brought us into like mass incarceration three, um, which would be the time where we've industrialized the situation around the war on drugs. And so now the, the, the budgets were, were exploding and, and crafted by people who went to esteemed institutions, places like Stanford Law School, Yale Law School, Harvard, you, know, you name it. And these are the people who are designing mass incarceration as we know it and putting billions and billions of dollars in it behind um, a really cynical approach to, to solving the drug problem. Um, and for most people, they wouldn't even believe that it was really about the drug problem. They would believe John Ehrlichman's statement that it was really about rounding up people of color and stopping advocacy and, and activism in the 60s. So with that as a foundation, you know, we get into more jailhouse lawyers, uh, more people of, of a civil rights variety taking on law cases and really trying to, to showcase what's really happening in the prisons. And you know, Brown v. Plata is a case that I would encourage everyone to understand fully, whether they come at it from a legal standpoint or a public health standpoint. Uh, this is a case in California that really started around 1990 uh, around mental health. And a judge showed that there was you know, insufficient staff, delays in treatment, involuntary medications, lack of medications, and around 2000, uh, there was also a, a medical case about lack of care, delay in treatment, insufficient staff. The DOC would, would inter interfere with treatment. Uh, there wasn't really any records. There was no real chronic care protocols. And people were dying. And so those cases really merged together. And they started from people on the inside. Uh, and then lawyers on the outside were really able to pick it up as it got further downstream. And... Uh, in 2009, the, the court ordered that you have to reduce your population down to 137% capacity, right? So you can imagine if you had a, a plane where there's 200 seats on it, that you have to reduce the capacity down to 274 people on the plane. That was basically what California was dealing with, with their overpopulation problem, uh, which of course then turns into these other inabilities to, to provide medical or, or mental health care. Um, so for California, it was trying to reduce 40,000 people uh, from 150,000 people. So California appealed the order. They didn't want to comply, all the things. And in 2011, there's a really important uh, Supreme Court ruling that you all can read, Brown v. Plata. Um, you know, and it talks about these, these very issues that we're, we're, we're talking about here around how we treat health uh, on the inside. And so California basically didn't reduce their population by 40,000. Uh, what they did was they moved uh, a lot of people into county jails. They moved a lot of people out of state. They moved a lot of people into private prison contracts. Uh, everyone's heard of like GEO, for example, moved into those spaces. Uh, people came to Louisiana who were from California to, to stay in those sheriff jails that are basically treated like private prisons. And uh, thousands more also were given parole. And so there were some releases. Uh, but the thing is, they never actually address the problem because the problem is not that America doesn't have enough prison beds for all the people convicted of crimes. It's not that there's not enough funding uh, for medical care to treat all the people who are incarcerated. Uh, the problem is that we've got a society and a culture that thinks so low of our own people that we could stack them like firewood and shut the door and walk away. And so everyone on this call, including myself, is complicit in that. Uh, the, our tax dollars go to it our inability to look on the inside, our inability to hold public officials accountable. It allows us to, to have a problem that is, that is so bad, so tinderbox, so you know, petri dish for disease, 
and the, the feeling that none of us can do anything about it. So the reality is people are doing something about it. And our organization, though Voice of the Experience is part of that solution, but we're also an outgrowth of, of what's considered the problem. Uh, we were originally created inside of Angola Penitentiary by jailhouse lawyers, including Norris Henderson, who's our executive director, Biggie Johnson, Calvin Duncan, Chico Yancey, some amazing leaders on the inside who decided that we didn't want to just try to get out. Uh, we had to deal with the conditions, not just of the prison, but also of the system itself. Why are all these folks going in? What is the, what is the process? Why are they keeping everybody? Uh, why is there no medical care? So things were so bad in Angola that among other things, they had to create their own hospice program because people were dying, you know, I mean, today people die one or two a week, uh, mostly of old age or of uh, chronic diseases. And so that hospice program, that desire to create it, you know, a few decades later is now part of our Fulman Incarcerated Transition Clinic, uh, which is a partnership with, under the leadership of Dr. Anjali Naogi, uh, who's down here in New Orleans. And we've got two community health workers who are formerly incarcerated, Danielle and Haki. And we're doing our best to really give people the treatment or at least connect them with it that they didn't receive on the inside. Um, we have 30 staff across both our organizations, Vote and Voters Organized to Educate. Uh, we've got four chapters across the state and over half of our, of our staff is formerly incarcerated. Um, many of the others have either currently or, or formerly a significant other uh, who's been incarcerated. So we're very, we're very close to the problem. Uh, and when something happens, our phones are going to blow up, our emails are going to blow up, our, our mailboxes are going to blow up. And so we have a, a really real time connection with what's happening in, on, inside the prisons. And so uh, our, our, C, our 501c4 that does some political activity has a campaign called Know Your Vote. And so we've supported a few uh, po political candidates uh, in, in the time that have expressed an alliance with our values and want criminal justice reform and, and want all the things to, to try to create a more, uh, a more healthy and uh, responsive system to the community needs. And so one of those is Governor John Bell Edwards. Another is the current district attorney, Jason Williams in, in New Orleans. And so around us has really built grown this movement uh you know people like norris going back to the 70s but now here we are today where there's a, a real a real hub of activity that, that's happening and promise of justice initiative uh for example is one of these organizations and about five years ago filed a lawsuit around medical conditions here in louisiana and then as was mentioned in my bio which people only remember that i was a dj but uh, you know was that i'm a, a robert wood johnson fellow along with a law professor, Andrew Armstrong, and a public health professor, Ashley Wennerstrom. And prior to COVID, we were embarking on looking at the state of healthcare in prisons and jails in Louisiana. Uh, and last year, well, in 2019, prior to COVID, the state legislature asked us to prepare a report on that very topic. So I say all that to say that in a certain type of way, we were ready when COVID hit. And I'm sure everybody or most people probably have a, a sort of a, a, a moment in time when they realized that there was going to be this thing, right? It wasn't just a story about something happening in Wuhan. Um, all of a sudden it became real. For some of us who are basketball fans, maybe we were watching the game when they literally shut down the league. And for me, I, w I got a car the very next day and I drove from New Orleans to Providence to get my 12 year old daughter. Um, because I wanted her to be with me because I had no idea what was going to happen. And there's a helicopter flying overhead, watching every move, but no. Um, and so for us, you know, they're very close to the issue. Our thoughts immediately went to the people who are, who are incarcerated, uh, our loved ones, our friends. And similarly, those people immediately started reaching out to us with like, a, what's going on? What's happening? What, what, what's going to happen next? This and that. And we knew the likely trajectory of COVID-19 or any communicable disease from uh, you know, where it sort of is the initial hotbed and then branching on out. Now, as I think everyone on, on this, this uh, Zoom is, is probably uh, aware of, of course, is that there are a lot of people who are deniers that didn't want to really uh, appreciate how communicable diseases travel. Uh, and we were so wired 
to the people incarcerated to be the disposable, uh, you know, deplorables and the firewood that could be stacked up, that even when there was the specter of a prison pandemic, the belief system was still that the incarcerated people are somehow the ones who are wrong. But the reality is it could only come in through the guards and staff. That was the only way that, the, that, the, that it was gonna come into the prison. And so a lot of those people were probably mass deniers and, and also you know, had this mythical belief that you could only, you can only give it when you have like a high temperature or something, or that's the only time we know you're sick, right? And it's the idea that people would be asymptomatic carriers for some reason just wasn't sinking in with so much of the American population. And so you can imagine in an incarceral situation where people are really geared towards just keeping people in, keeping everything in, keeping information in, keeping facts in, keeping you know the, the law out. And so when everything was kept in, you couldn't get a real straight answer about what was going to be the plan. And so, you know, we had to respond to all these, these uh, calls and emails and, and, and letters from the inside by literally hiring staff to create what became known as Mission Possible. Um, because our folks refuse to believe that anything is impossible. And so they named it themselves Mission Possible. And we really set out to share this intel with the world. Uh, and so lots of media folks, lots of, uh, you know, some of those civil rights lawyers, um, government actors, they want to know from us what was really going on on the inside. And so uh, we created a, a COVID page on our website and we immediately, I mean, back in March, created some demands of the governor and, you know, they included release everybody who's within six months of the gate, which we thought would be relatively less controversial considering we have this, you know, this, uh, this epidemic on our hands. And, you know, that would, or basically if you gave everyone six months, if you're doing 20 years, you're not gonna get out. But if you're doing six months, you'll go home. If you're doing nine months, you'll get home in three, three months and that sort of thing. And so really it would only impact people who are going to be getting out by the end of the summer anyway. Uh, we wanted them to fast track geriatric parole and medical furloughs for people who who are at risk uh, of, of contracting the real complications, people who are elderly. Um, and we wanted them to put the Department of Health and or the CDC in charge. Everyone sees the movies when there's some kind of outbreak and there's usually some, some sheriff or police officer who ends up getting in the way. And there's some nerdy scientist who's like trying to get his or her team, you know, in, in charge and all that. And, and we know ultimately it requires both of them to work together to win. Now that's a movie situation, but we know in real life it would it would have to be the same way. Um, but they're not wired to do that. They're not geared to you know embrace science or medicine in a scenario like this. They're really just geared to stack the firewood. Now I don't want to take away the humanity of people who do work inside the, the the prison and jail system. I'm sure there's plenty of decent people. The problem is when you get into a system and you're caught sort of doing your job you do your job. And, and a lot of people live in fear of doing that job wrong or being called out by some boss. And so that becomes a, sort of a, a problem where, where maybe everyone wants to say or do the right thing, but they're not empowered to do so. Um, and for us in Louisiana, and it's a, a, a version of this everywhere. I mean, we have a, a gulag system of about a hundred different institutions that oversee people in work release, local jail, uh, federal immigrant detention. We have 10,000 people who got shipped in from the border to live in those, those sheriff's jails um, and, and be held for you know, a year, two, three years even, awaiting whether they're gonna get deportation, um, you know, uh, immigration parole, sort of awaiting that hearing, um, or be given status so they could stay in this country. We have that, we have private prisons, we have federal prison, we have state prison, and only someone like the state public health officer in the same way that you would, you know, oversee, uh, let's say, um, you know, disease in restaurants or something in, in a city or a state, you know, you, you have someone who's a, who has that authority to go into all these places. And, you know, what we ended up getting was our state health officer ultimately, uh, after pressure from us, uh, put out a statement that was aligned with what needed to be done. And then it was retracted within 24 hours. 
And so it was things like that, that, that made us aware that we might not be able to get what needs to be done here. Um, there's a lot of, there was suddenly there was a lot of turnover for people who either were getting booted out of the way or said, I don't want this to be on, on my record. And so we saw wardens uh, dying. We saw head medical people at prisons dying, guards dying. New York Times put out a story about the Oakdale Federal Penitentiary and people who worked in that town uh, would be shunned when they'd go to the gas station or something who worked in the prisons. Uh, people be like, oh no, they work in the prison. And things were really getting worse and worse as it infiltrated into those communities and then from amongst those prison guards or, or health workers um, or administrative staff, it would then make its way into the prison where people live in dorms like firewood, bunk bed, bunk bed, bunk bed, bunk bed, and folks can be snoring at night. And if you're, you're infected, I can only imagine what it's like to, to, to be sleeping, you know, within two feet of a snorer who has COVID-19. I mean, you might as well just say, you know, hand it to me now because, you know, eventually you're, you're going to get it by morning. So, the governor created a health equity task force, um, you know, we were hoping was going to serve as like cover for releases and they created a, um, a release mechanism that had so much red tape and so many people involved that eight months later, uh, you know, into the, into the pandemic, you know, when they finally, I think, released the first person, they ended up releasing uh, about 19 people, I think, and then they shut it down. And they all were people who were very close to the door. And meanwhile, they could have released several thousand people who, who had gotten out between March and September, who got out at that time anyway, they could have released them and, and sort of eased the, the pressure on, on the overcrowding uh, early on, but they, they didn't do that. And so these are things that really need to be acknowledged um, about what has happened so that we can be ready for the next one. Uh, the, the, the Department of Health evaded our public records request when we, we wanted to know what sort of plans uh, and, and who had meet, met to come up with uh, some sort of harm reduction, realistically, strategies and how they're going to do it. Prisons, not just in Louisiana, but many of them, you know, came up with this idea of the reverse quarantine, where we're just going to put all the infected people together and, and then, you know, they're going to, in stages, make their way out. It was done in a very ramshackle way. Uh, and I'm sure this is from what I understand from several other prisons, you know, it's the type of thing that it helped create, you know, 75, 90% infection rates, uh, even in some prisons, uh, I think, you know, upwards to, to 100%, you know, in, in certain facilities. And so one could guess that perhaps the thinking was, we're gonna create this herd immunity by everybody getting it and they can't get it twice. It's like chicken pox parties or something. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to admit to that, but it's, it's the only thing that actually kind of makes some sense of like, maybe that's what they were thinking. Now we can disagree with it, but at least it shows you were thinking something. Hey guys, speaking of my daughter. Um, and so, so what we did see also was, um, you know, some, some slowing of the police uh, responses in the communities um, in terms of trying to arrest people for, for petty things. We saw a slowing of the courts. Uh, we saw more people getting getting bailed than, than before. And what we also saw in that time was just how unnecessary incarceration is as a, as a, a catch-all policy for everything. You know, locking someone up for truancy doesn't seem so important when there's a pandemic on the inside, but maybe it seems like a, a nice thing to do when you have a lot of money and you have empty uh, prison beds. So. We did a, a vigil outside the women's facility, a, a vigil outside uh, the jail. We had a march to Angola. We really wanted to raise awareness, despite the risk and the unknowns to our own folks, um, but needed to do something. We needed to kind of come together and remind you know, us on the outside and then our folks on the inside that we do care, that we are here, and, and we're really fighting for something. And of course, everyone knows that you know, the, the George Floyd legacy began around the same time. And there was a lot of activism in the communities around the country. And so these things really merged together uh, to, to really you know, bring some attention to this very vital issue uh, of total oppression and, and injustice and, and inequitable treatment uh, in a place where it's entirely unnecessary. 
So there are vaccinations happening now on the inside. Um, I believe that most prisons have now been able to give uh, vaccines to people that are, you know, in the, the elderly or at risk uh, populations for those who want it. I'm not aware of anyone forcing vaccinations on anyone. Uh, we And we've tried to, just like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and other famous people, you know, putting out commercials away, we've tried to, to say the vaccine's okay. Now, that may run a risk. Let's say the vaccine's not okay. Sorry, don't jump on my case if you're an epidemiologist. But, you know, to put your name on anything the government is doing, from our perspective, uh, is a risk. Because we run the risk of losing credibility with our community uh, if, if things go wrong. And it may not be that the vaccine is or is not effective. It may also be the way that it's, that it's handled or given out or applied. Uh, so it, as I mentioned, you know, prisons can be a, a, a real dungeon of, of information getting, getting out. So you don't necessarily know what's going on. There's a, a level of trust you have to give. Um, and to a certain degree, you know, a lot of prison officials around the country have not earned that trust. And probably many of them don't have any desire to earn that trust. Um, another, Another good thing that's happened uh, in, in recent times is that that lawsuit that I mentioned that Promise of Justice uh, filed, it's called, called Lewis v. Cain, that came out uh, victorious just a few days ago. And reading it, you literally think you're reading Brown v. Plata. It's the same situation and all that. Here, I'm speaking for, uh, for a real, sorry. Can I, She's looking at the TV. Thank you. She's got back from a flight from her mom's. Um, so, uh, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, there's no real system. You know, the DOC gets in the way of treatment. Uh, you know, it can take a couple of years. There, you can get tests that don't get forwarded to the specialist who then sees you. Months delays uh, in, in, in getting to the next phase of your treatment. No real protocols for, for, the, uh, for the chronically ill and, and people dying because of it. And so, you know, it, it kind of remains to be seen how this, the, the, the aftermath plays out um, but I think having a lot of us and, you know, our organizations and our people, you know, in, in position to, to push for that is good news. Um, and each election that, that we've seen over the last, you know, five years, we see more candidates and more winning candidates really aware of the problem that mass incarceration has presented for us. And they're much more open to solutions than, than they ever were. And so where do we go from here? I mean, the number one thing that, that any and all of us can do is really to pierce the veil of secrecy that is around prisons and jails. Um, you know, we have a right and an obligation to know what's going on. And we really need to see some of those spaces like jails, you know, as a triage center. Uh, you know, a sheriff doesn't decide who goes in. They don't decide when they get out. But what they're going to see for, you know, from a few hours to a few days in you know, a time for months are people who are the most vulnerable in our community people who are, are dealing with addiction and, and, and homelessness and, and mental health issues, trauma. And these things can be dealt with in a harm reduction model. Uh, I'd like to see doctors and public health officials run for sheriff to become wardens, uh, to see how it is that they can take better care of the people that they've been given large budgets to just kind of hold in place. Uh, but there's much more to do than just hold someone in place and just see if they survive. Uh, you know, governors that are appointed, uh, you know, they, they, that they appoint the DOC heads, uh, they need to be aligned with, with principles of public health. Uh, you know, prison doctors uh, should be encouraged to be people who are coming from, let's say, a um, you know, social justice background, people who might take a nonprofit rate to work with a, an at-risk community uh, in an urban environment or in another country. Uh, they should be hopefully, you know, going towards the, um, <laughs> They should, be, <laughs> they should be going towards the, uh, you know, the prisons and jails as well to see how they might be able to, to treat and, and help people in, in that community. Um, you know, we, we need to get past seeing people as stacks of firewood that we can lock it away behind the door and, and forget. And it's really important for us across, you know, inside and outside to look at our own institutions, our own jobs, our own positions of power and, and ask ourselves, you know, what are we doing? Uh, to support people? How are we advancing leadership? How are we lifting up expertise? How are we giving people a way back? Are we giving them something to say yes to? Um, are we denying, if, for those that are academically affiliated, you know, are we denying admissions? Do we believe in educating all people or just a, a select few? 
Uh, and, and what does that do if we believe in just the select few? What does that do to our, our sort of our common approach to things and, and handling problems like this uh, and, and just the greater good? So with that, I'll, 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 I'll close for now and I'll, and I'll push it back to, to Daisy. And I really appreciate uh, you being gracious enough to, to hear what I have to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bruce, um, for that really like illuminating reflection. That was great. Um, so yeah, we're going to move on to our moderated panel discussion. And so to all of those who are attending, we encourage you to ask questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the panel. And we'll devote a few minutes at the end um, to answering audience questions. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce our panelists. So joining us today, we have Dr. Rosemary Malanga Gunda, who is a public health specialist from Zimbabwe with over 30 years of experience. Her experience lies in health systems research, design, implementation, and monitoring and evaluation of public health interventions focused on HIV AIDS and maternal child and adolescent health. She currently works as a researcher and technical advisor within the Faculty of Health and medical services, family medicine, global and public health departments, and is part of the Center for Evaluation of Public Health Interventions at the University of Zimbabwe. In the past seven years, her research has focused on the health of people in penal institutions within the Southern African region. She is a reviewer for the International Journal of Prisoner Health, and in 2020, she was appointed a committee member for the Worldwide Prison Health Research and Engagement Network Scientific Conference. Uh, we're also joined by Charlene Fletcher, who is a historian, educator, writer, and currently the Emerging Voices Postdoctoral Research Associate in Slavery and Justice at Brown University. She holds a PhD in history from Indiana University, specializing in 19th century United States and African American history and gender studies. Prior to attending IU, Charlene led a domestic violence and sexual assault program, as well as a large re-entry initiative in New York City, assisting women and men in their transition from incarceration to society. And she also served as a lecturer, a lecturer of criminal justice at the City University of New York. She currently serves as the National Publications Director for the Association of Black Women Historians. We're also joined by Marcelo Bergman, who is a professor of sociology and criminology at the Universidad Nacional de Tres de Febrero in Argentina and writes on a variety of issues related to crime, public security, illegal drugs, and public policies in Latin America. Other areas of his research include taxation, compliance, and rule of law in the region. Professor Bergman is particularly interested in the evidence-based research on criminal justice, citizen security, and illegal drug policies in Latin America. And lastly, our moderator is Dr. Salman Kasevji, and who is a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School and is the director of Harvard Medical School's Center for Global Health Delivery. He is also a physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at the Boston Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he is an associate professor of medicine. Dr. Kasevji is a leading expert in tuberculosis treatment and the anthropology of health policy. He is the author of Blind Spot, How Neoliberalism Infiltrated Global Health, and has worked extensively with the Boston-based nonprofit Partners in Health on the treatment of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Over the last 20 years, his research has resulted in a number of clinical and policy manuscripts on TB and MDR-TB, which have had si significant clinical and policy impact. And he has conducted clinical and implementation research on MDR-TB in Russia, both in the prison and civilian sectors, and launched one of the first community-based treatment programs for MDR-TB resistant tuberculosis and HIV co-infection in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, he's been involved with the work of the START Coalition, committed to using layered technologies to keep spaces safe from airborne disease transmission. So with that, I'll pass it over to our moderator. Thank you so much, Daisy, and, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Bruce has really given us this um, really uh, incredible food for thought and started us off. So I, I wanna, um, uh, ask a question just to, you know, of the other panelists, which is that, you know, we prison, prisoners in many US jails uh, um, have to pay for soap and hand sanitizers is often banned. You know, we've heard that in Argentina, 
Uh, prisoners have no individual cells, but uh, but uh, you know are in community pavilions, which house more than house more than a hundred people. We've seen that in many other countries. Um, in in some African countries, more than forty percent of the prison population are pretrial detainees. The numbers, of course, are high here also in the United States. So these are a few of the examples of the ways that people are denied basic rights and liberties uh, necessary to protect their health. But we also see this legacy, and I think I think Bruce kind of alluded to it and talked a little bit about it. But you know, if, even if you read literature, Victor Hugo and you know wrote *Les Misérables* in 1862, and you know prisons were a place where you know not were a place where you go as punishment, but you go there for continuous punishment. Uh, and it's so something. It's a legacy that's been around for for quite a while. So what does this reveal about the history and legacy of punishment, and how how does that uh, link directly to uh, you know, the health of those inside. And maybe, uh, Marcelo, if, if, if you don't mind, we could start with you to just to tell us a little bit about what's happening in South America and, and think about that legacy there. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the invitation. And uh, yeah, indeed, a very uh, important question. What I would like to remark is that Latin America has had a complete transformation in the prison system over the last 30 years because Exactly 30 years ago, started the process of mass incarceration, what you in the United States have seen uh, for, for, for many decades. Uh, there are some differences between the mass incarceration process in Latin America to the mass incarceration in, in the US. As much as in the US, there is uh, a critique of, of, of mass incarceration, there is still a lot of funding being funneled to, uh, to house millions of people. In Latin America, there are 1.6 million people behind bars, but, uh, uh, but the level of mass incarceration, the level of, uh, of overcrowding, it's 200%, 250, and there are even prison systems. I cannot, I, I'd be happy to show pictures, but the, uh, there are prison systems that, uh, prison units that had 300% uh, uh, overcrowding. So, um, so what we have is a process of mass incarceration over the last three decades without the proper funding uh, to, um, to house these people, this number of people. Uh, why is, um, uh, and I believe that it is very much in line with, with Victor Hugo's uh, uh, story in, in the Miserable. Uh, there is a continuing of punishment um, and it's also an application or, 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 or uh, an idea that governments um, do not know how to deal with rising crime. Uh, so the best and most uh, immediate response is to incarcerate people for very minor crime. That's a big difference with the US. Uh, uh, people in, the, in Latin America, most countries in Latin America, the major 80% of the admissions are for really petty crime, uh, small drug transactions, small uh, thefts. Uh, so, so, so actually prisons and, and, and the jail system became a sort of um, uh, 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 instrument to punish people for small um, for small crime or for petty crime uh, because the systems were not able to find other ways to do it. Now things are, have exploded because we do have the process of mass incarceration without the proper funnel, uh, funding and that obviously under COVID created an immense problems hard to solve. So I will stop it here and pass it along. Uh, sorry, I was on mute. Thanks, Marcelo. That's uh, interesting. You know, Rosemary, I'm I'm struck by the situation in Africa as well. What's what's driving that? Is it is it similar to what's happening in the U.S.? Is it a legacy of colonialism? Like, what what are the drivers of this? So many people being imprisoned and the situations in in African prisons. Uh, within the African prisons in sub-Saharan Africa, I think uh, our problem really is a uh, it's pre-colonial. And uh, the coming in liberators have also sort of taken over from where the colonialists are uh, left off. So you see a lot of um, people 
being incarcerated, and most of them are political activists. And like you said, pre-trial detentions, we've got a huge percentage of our uh, people being incarcerated. And sometimes for pre-trial detention, it can even go up to five years before one stands trial. And again, it goes back to the problem of the justice system itself. Then also the problem of overcrowding is, is really problematic. And from a public health perspective, you find that you know uh, prisons now become a vehicle whereby most contagions are actually uh, spread. And uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we, are, we do not have the leisure like the developed countries where there's uh, a lot of funding and uh, that we, the resources are really scarce. Talk of social distancing and uh, talk of uh, hygiene, because we all know that uh, those have been the hallmark, the mitigatory uh, preventative strategies that have been uh, employed worldwide. But in most sub-Saharan African prisons, even water is a problem. Yeah. Soap yeah. is a problem they have to rely most of the prisons on philanthropic organizations or church organizations coming into prison. Um, over the years, we have seen also some improvement in the space of uh, sexual reproductive health of women who are incarcerated is concerned. At least uh, they are allowed, the prison system is uh, sort of opened up a bit to allow churches to come in with uh, sanitary towels and also to provide soap for the inmates. So governments really, uh, prisons don't receive enough budget allocation from central governments to be able to actually carry out their mandate. Then the health delivery system as well is uh, there are international minimum standards that are expected and the health that should be given to even inmates that are incarcerated should be equal to that that is being received by the general population. But you come across uh, you know, a lot of problems within Sub-Saharan African uh, prisons where the shortage of staff, diagnostic equip equipment, uh, medicines, even for the children as well. So yeah, that's the situation basically in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the challenges are uh, continue from pre-colonial to independence and uh, we are still carrying on overcrowding in, in lack of sanitation, in human filthy and overcrowded prison conditions that are poorly ventilated, and uh, lack of soap, bedding, linen, and cleaning materials, and even the food. Food is also problematic. The adequacy of the food and also the quality is very poor. Then also, I, I've already alluded to that, the issue of our prison-based health service provision. And it also affects the continuum of care because uh, if they have an emergency and they have to transfer, there is a problem. Because sometimes maybe the ambulance is broken down, sometimes there's no fuel, and the fiscus, the fiscus is not actually allocating enough resources to, uh, to enable the uh, prisoners to be treated with dignity and mm. also receive the same equal standard of health from those in the general population. A really frightening situation. Um, you know, Charlene, th thank you, Rosemary. Charlene, you know, uh, in one of the questions, Christopher Labby said that this, you know, the, what, what, what's being described uh, by Bruce uh, sounds like an institutional culture problem. Um, and, and of course, he, he mentioned the issue of private prisons. And so, Charlene, I'm just wondering, could you comment, what is the linkage uh, with the industrial prison complex in the U.S. and if you you know if you know globally, like what 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 is that is that a driver of this and how is it driving what's going on in the in the prisons? Charlene, did, did you hear me? Did or did you lose connection? I think maybe Charlene has, a, has, has lost connection. So we'll-, we'll... Yeah. Oh, thank you so much oh. Um, oh, great. for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be here. And Bruce, can you hear me? 
it's really choppy, Charlene. Did you did you hear my question? Can you hear me? No, say, speak again. Can you hear me? We can, but it, it's kind of choppy. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes, yes. Can you can you hear us? Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Great. Sorry about that. The joys of technology, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know if the question <laughs> came through. I was saying that you I know heard, Bruce alluded to the to private prisons, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if you know we have this horrible history in the United States, and and we're seeing worldwide of the, of how prisoners are treated, and it's linked. You know, certainly it's linked to to race and poverty and, and and certainly disease. But what what do you think the you know what's the linkage with the with the prison industrial complex? Like, is it, how is that driving this in the U.S. and other places? So, I want to say first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And Bruce really kind of when he mentioned um, quote unquote convict leasing and something that, um, you know, we tend to think of it as something that began using to um, one, retain uh, a lifestyle as close to enslavement as possible, but two, also to boost their economies after uh, the war had ended. But um, I'm here to share with you that that practice is much older than the 1860s and it is not rooted in the 13th amendment it's it's broader than that convict leasing was something that was taking place in the mid uh the early to mid 19th century and one of the first states to actually engage in the practice was kentucky as early as 1820 and so what you have uh, the state is decides we're not going to uh, manage the prison we are going to lease the prison and the incarcerated uh, folks within the facility to a private individual. And that private individual then uh, turned and made profit um, by leasing the individuals who were incarcerated within. And so uh, incarcerated men, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, would be leased out to farms. They would be leased out to uh, mines, they would be leased out uh, to a whole host of other places, um, even to the point of, um, you know, being contracted other wealthy individuals, because of course, the lessee was someone of prominence. The lessee was someone who was elected or uh, who was appointed by the General Assembly. And this person stood to make quite a bit of money um, in this early national period. Now, you see race really beginning to take, um, to, to have a foothold after the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment, but spaces like Kentucky really served as a model for what would come later uh, in the postbellum period. And so what drives this, honestly, capitalism. That's what drives this. Uh, when you have folks who, um, see <clears throat> incarcerated men, women, and children in the United States, just as we do adults, um, when they are viewed as commodities, um, it's no wonder that, you know, this idea of warehousing people uh, in spaces, or as Bruce mentioned, um, um, seeing people packed in like, a um, stack of firewood, right? Um, if you are, um, if you don't see folks who are incarcerated, one as human, with various struggles that may have led them to this space of incarceration, and poverty is definitely one of those, um, <clears throat> then you see them as commodities. It's easier to warehouse folks um, when you see them just as that commodities. Um, so you have convict leasing in this space, but then going forward into the 20th and 21st century with private prisons, um, it's the same idea uh, where states will co uh, contract with private uh, prison industries and 
uh, require that the state keep the facility fill, uh, filled to a specific capacity. Usually that's about 90 to 98% um, capacity. And if the state does not meet that uh, goal, if you will, um, they still have to turn around and, and, and remit payment to the private contractor. Uh, but what state legislatures will do is they mm -hmm. will <clears throat> increase, um, they will criminalize other sorts of behaviors. They will uh, review and revamp sentencing laws to, to enforce harsher sentences in order to keep folks in these carceral spaces much longer. Um, and that creates a whole host of other problems. You know, we're talking about public health, we're talking about access to health care, we're talking about, uh, you mentioned, you know, just access, having to pay for soap. Um, having access to things like hand sanitizer. Um, there were a group of incarcerated men in Texas who actually sued the state and won because Texas was not adhering to um, social distancing guidelines. They were not giving folks hand sanitizer and everything else. And like Bruce said, um, COVID had to be brought in to the facility uh, on top of the fact that there are already you know, so many variants of communicable diseases within the prison because you have people living in such close quarters. Um, when people are hit with, in the United States, we have this problem of giving people ridiculous sentences. Um, because we have these mandatory minimums and we have, uh, you know, such lengthy sentences, life sentences, uh, what that creates in the United States is, an, is uh, uh, an issue with aging, an aging incarcerated population. And so you have um, folks who not only are struggling with public health issues, but you also have folks who are susceptible to a whole host of other um, um, health issues, ailments, or what have you, simply because of their age. Uh, and this is only an issue because the United States seeks to incarcerate people for, you know, long periods of time. Um, and that goes back to your question about, you know, this continuity of punishment. Um, are we seeking to punish or are we seeking to rehabilitate? And I can guarantee you it's not to rehabilitate. Um, <clears throat> because that continuity of punishment extends beyond the wall. Um, we have a whole host of um, issues for folks uh, that formerly incarcerated folks face, uh, whether it's just the stigma of being incarcerated within this country, um, access to health care even after release. And there are spaces that are working towards addressing those issues, absolutely, but nonetheless, they exist. Uh, being able to actually, um, pro, you know, provide for yourself, to make a living for yourself. There's, again, that stigma um, can prohibit someone from obtaining um, gainful employment. Um, it can prohibit someone from um, reconnecting with family. And while not all formerly incarcerated folks have these issues, they are very prevalent in this country. You know, we are not a monolithic group, group of people. Everybody has a different experience, but these are, these are challenges that folks face. Um, but this idea of the prison industrial complex is it's much older than, you know, post-Civil War. Um, this idea of profiting on punishment is something that you see um, in the United States uh, well before um, South Carolina seceded from the Union. Really interesting. Rosemary, let me come back to you for a second. Um, you know, we now have this COVID-19 situation, which is kind of like an x-ray on our society, right? Like it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's showing where all the fractures are you know, Charlene just mentioned, and, and, and before her, Bruce uh, and Marcelo, that, that this has been going on for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, we, we've known that prisons are a problem. There's all sorts of other diseases that have been uh, an issue in prisons for, you know, for a while, from hep B to hep C to other airborne diseases like TB. Um, has, has COVID pushed us forward in any way? Has it made us rethink uh, places of incarceration? Like, you know, they have, as it made us rethink 
them as institutions? Has it made us rethink them as providers of healthcare? Like what's happened in Africa? Are people saying, wow, we've got to fix this? Or are they just putting their head in the sands? What's happening there? I think basically when our resources are finite on the ground, prisons are the last, or inmates are the last to be considered in any country where resources are really not equitably distributed. And uh, we've had other, other infectious conditions as well. And uh, COVID has just brought to the fore that, you know, prison health is public health. There's no way we can continue to turn our heads and put bare our heads in the sand because something has to happen within the prison walls. Because if you, we are not mitigating or our states are not mitigating and taking care of um, inmates, it's actually bound to spill over into the community. Because we've got officers that are working within prisons, when they are done with their shifts, they leave and they go home. And that's how likely it's, it might end up spreading in the general community. So it's not like people are really burying their heads in the sand, but I think strong advocates is really needed so that our African leaders can you know, really put uh, public health uh, within the prison setting at the forefront. Because if we are not going to be looking at uh, the inmates, and continue to say whatever is happening in prison. Yes, they, they are saving their sentences, but we forget that they are still part of society. And at the end of saving their punishment, they are going to go back and join the same population that they came from. So that's how contagions actually end up spreading in the general population because we are not taking care of the public health within prison settings. So Rosemary, let me let me push you a little bit there because I recall uh, when we were working on drug resistant TB in the Russian prisons, there was a recognition that prisons were an epidemiologic pump. You know, the, the disease was spreading. People would go back to their communities when they were released, or people coming in from jail would bring in more disease, and there was this cycle. And I have to say that you know it took some years, but the Russians did push for more decarceration. Are you seeing? the same push in, in African countries? Because, you know, the people, I think what we've heard from people is that some people are there for no reason and or, or for little reason. So is there a push for decarceration? Because clearly that reduces the cost, right? Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, when uh, the pandemic hit uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, because there was nothing much on offer, there was no vaccine, there was no other treatment except social distancing. And we have African presidents actually coming on the scene to give presidential amnesties, to decongest the prisons. And I think uh, Zimbabwe on, on its end as well, they've actually been considering not incarcerating women for especially uh, petty crimes so that maybe they can give them uh, a punishment of uh, community service instead of actually bringing them in and incarcerating them. So yes, uh, they've been trying to decongest, but like uh, what I'm saying, these structures are old and dilapidated. They're simply overcrowding in prisons and that is uh, where the problem actually is. The president can give up, uh, presidential pardons once in a while, but before we know it, again, for really petty, petty, petty crimes, we find that you know the jails are full. So uh, I think okay. uh, I think that one really becomes a bit of a problem, and uh, some of those uh, crimes really are just public nuisance crimes that don't deserve incarceration. But again, because of the politics of Africa, we find that you know a lot of people when you go into prison are those human rights defenders, activists. Those are the ones that are actually bearing the brunt of uh, this pandemic because they are mixed with uh, other inmates, even if testing is done, like uh, a lot has been written, I think on um, Zimbabwe, a lot of what we know that is happening in most of the prisons has come out from the independent media and not from really the government. So whatever we know that is happening is actually coming from the independent media and from those activists that are willing mm -hmm. to give interviews after the uh, discharge and really COVID is a real threat and it's a problem. Interesting. Mar Marcelo, tell me, you know, you, you've written so many, so much work about 
about the law and prisons and things. Um, why are people not hearing this? Like, you know, we you, you read in the newspaper that that say like rates of COVID in a prison in Mexico is, you know, two and a half times that of, of, of other other Mexicans. You, you, you know, you read the same thing in the United States. Uh, it's, it's obvious. Every one of you has referred to overcrowding. I realize you, you've all mentioned um, that there's this culture of, of devaluation of the lives of prisoners, but, but wh why are people not hearing it from the public health perspective? Because you would imagine just for selfish reasons, people would say, we recognize this is some sort of epidemiologic pump. There's a lot of in and out movement. We need to do something. What's, what's the gap? Why, why, why do people not hear this? Oh, it's a very complex question. It's yeah. a, <laughs> sorry. It, it, it is, it is, um, uh, look, let, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, at the beginning of COVID, um, uh, there was a push by lawyers, by judges, by prison administrators to release some of the inmates with different programs, kind of uh, early release or house arrest or uh, for minor crimes or, um, even programs like in Africa of uh, releasing a large proportion of women uh, in jail. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and public opinion in most countries of Latin America were completely against. Mm. Uh, public opinion uh, likes the tough on crime policies. And that's unfortunate, but, but you know, they, they will be willing to hear, uh, you know, the, the epidemic bomb or the, the that you know these these conditions create, but but really do not think fast forward uh, into the future and say, oh, okay, uh, this is this is creating a large problem. What the the majority of polls and surveys that we we conducted uh, show that that people are really against uh, being lenient uh, uh, against punishment. So in La in Latin America, there are no almost in no country there is no parole board. Uh, you know, things are being decided by judges. Usually judges are kind of progressive and try to reduce sentences, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you know, public opinion is against it. So, so that's my simple, my simple response. We do have, I carry with other groups of people, uh, uh, surveys, inmate servers in 14 countries uh, of Latin America over the last uh, eight years. And, and this is very consistently. Uh, sir, uh, uh, inmates report that they have very little access to medicine, very little access to, to, to care, food, everything. And they are, they are gaining their support from their families. The visits are very frequent. Um, now, people are even against that even against the visit by the state that does, does not supply does not supply the basics the families do but uh, uh, the population in general uh, disagree with with frequent visits of the inmates by their relatives it's kind of hard <laughs> wow and yet that's one of the the seven acts of mercy in 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 catholicism it's fascinating that you see that in latin america very very well, interesting yeah, I, 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 I'm talking about generally. I mean, there are different groups in society, of course, but but uh, you know, the politicians are being driven by the next election, so so they want to you know make decisions that uh, will gather will gather for them, gather for them votes. So, wow. so they react accordingly. Well, so just just to, I'm going to ask all of you the same question, um, and 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 I'll end with Bruce. Since he had the first word, I think we should give him the last word. But, you know, the, the question I have is I, I was really, you know, we, we've heard each of you describe in different ways this race, poverty, disease access, you know, that takes place in prisons. How, you know, I think Charlene put it well, it's linked to capitalism. And, and you know, I think if we look back, the, the bad treatment of, of prisoners probably has been the norm for you know, a thousand years or more, much longer, right back to the to the Romans. And I, and I just wonder, uh, and, and probably beyond. And you know, Bruce defined the problem very eloquently. He said, "We have a society and culture that thinks so low about our own people that we can stack them like wood and walk away." And you know, we see that not only in prisons, we see that in just the way workers are treated and, and a number of other things. 
So let's start with Charlene. Charlene, I don't know if your connection is good um, and if you're still hearing us. But I can you... hear you. I turned okay, my great. video off just to help things. Okay, great. So I, my question to you, you guys, since you're expert in this, and I've been struggling with this for the last 20 years, is how do we change this? Like, what do we need to do? And I know each of you has devoted your lives in different ways to thinking about this. It's hard to answer in the two minutes I'm gonna give you each, but, you know, uh, or two and a half minutes, but, but how, do, how do we change this? What do we do? How do we bring dignity back into this, the value of human life? Uh, how do we think about the well-being of prison guards? How do we think about justice and mercy in our society, the kind of society we wanna build? What do we have to do to get back here uh, capitalism is a strong force. These in, in prison industrial complex is strong. Public opinion, as, as Marcelo has just told us, is strong. What do we do? I think the first um, and, and probably one of the easiest spaces um, in which to begin is that of language. We have to change our language. If we change, when you change your language uh, regarding something, uh, it begins to shift the way that you respond to it, the way that you approach it. Uh, and I think that that's, that's key here. And so what do I mean by that? First and foremost, instead of calling someone a prisoner or an inmate or a convict or an ex-con or any other negative um, title or connotation that, that um, language tends to, that society tends to give um, to folks who are formerly incarcerated, um, change that up. Formerly incarcerated people. Um, because you're not speaking about the individual as this criminal, as this this ex-con or whatever the negative label is, you're speaking about an experience that that person may have had. And then ask yourself, what led them to that experience? Was it poverty? Because there's plenty of that in the United States, unnecessarily. Um, was it substance abuse? Because if that's the case, incarceration may have not been what that person needed, that person actually needs treatment, which in turn is a public health issue. And so when we begin to look at these experiences, um, we change our language and we look at the experience, um, it, it, it's, it provides an avenue for folks to shift their thinking and thus their approach. Now, is it easy to change things? No. Um, is it going to happen overnight? Absolutely not. However, um, you can change your language today. You can change your language right now and, and becoming more cognizant of that language. Um, you can, and that's a practice that you can continue to do every day. That way you as an individual, when you engage folks in these conversations, um, your, your, uh, your conversation, your perspectives uh, will help to also spread that changing. Uh, of language and 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 change the way that we view incarceration, the way that we um, change um, the the way that we view those who are incarcerated. Um, so that would be you know concrete boots on the ground. How do you start right now at the end of this panel? Change your language. Charlene, thank you. And I, I'm guilty as charged. Sadly, it's been taped, so I'm clearly guilty as charged that it's, you know, that this, uh, that the, um, yeah, it's very easy to fall back into, into this, this very common language that carries so much uh, stereotype with it. And, 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 and uh, uh, but, but I, sorry, go ahead. Just, just very quickly. It's not just those who have not been incarcerated, but people who have been incarcerated. You are not a former, you're not an inmate. You are not an ex, -con don't call yourself that. You are yeah. not a parolee. You just right. so happen to be on parole. So I, it's changing, I, changing that language broadly. Yeah, and, and, and you're right, language matters. The other thing that you've brought up that I think is so useful is that, you know, we, we, we when, when people have these stereotypes, they're ignoring the root causes, which are reasonably well understood. And so, you know, instead of going back and saying, why don't we address some of these root causes, 
it's just, you know, as, as uh, you know, as Bruce tells us, you know, we just think so low of our people that we'll, 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 we'll put them somewhere as a stack of wood and, and walk away. Uh, Marcelo, what's the answer for you? You've been looking at, at, at the criminal justice system, um, the criminal injustice system, <laughs> you know, the, what, what, what are you, what are you, what are you thinking? Where do we go? Well, there is a plenty of, uh, of different ways to do it. And the, the most important thing is to learn from, from successful cases. Western Europe uh, has reduced significantly the, the number of, of, of people behind bars. I would say, speaking for Latin America, probably also for the United States, but uh, I, I, will, I will avoid stepping into in, in a place that I'm not, not a specialist. But uh, the first thing... Um, there are different ways, but I will, I will highlight two. The first is make prisons a place for hard criminals. With whomever is not a hard criminal, we need to find a community solution to the problem. We invest, uh, uh, prisons are costly. So the same amount of money can be invested in, in, in trying to uh, uh, heal uh, problems in the community without incarcerating people. Uh, that means that we should, as, a, as it was said, we should rethink about drug, uh, no, I mean, we should think drug problems as health problems and not uh, a criminal problem that will reduce significantly the number of people behind bars and also petty crimes. Um, and uh, so, so we, we are thinking about is, is sentencing reform. Sentencing reform, not to make it I mean, prolong, you know, a large number of years uh, behind bars, but, but, you know, only sentencing people for, for hard crime, for, for violent crimes, uh, and uh, the less amount of time possible, not the harder amount of all of them. We, we Marcelo, have a lot how, do we, how do we get there? Sorry to interrupt you, but I want to push you on this. In your previous answer, you said people are demanding that their populations, sorry, that their politicians support prisons. How do you at the same time get to this change that you're talking about, if that's the case? Well, there are different ways, but uh, one is that it will hurt your pocket. Uh, it happened in California, it happened you know, all, that, all over the place. I mean, you, uh, prisons are expensive, you have to pay more taxes for them. So, so people start to think, well, if I have to pay taxes, uh, let's think twice about this. Um, the, other, the other venue is uh, taking about the example, your example from Russia, and, and there are different examples in different places. If you convince authorities about the futility of incarcerating and rotating people in and out of prison, in and out of prison, that the, the problem is extended to the community, to the families, to the relatives. I mean, that is, that is creating more problems. I mean, prisons create more problems, not solve more problems. I mean, that, that's the education of, uh, uh, that we need to undertake to the policymakers. And there are some good experiences. As I said, Western Europe, arrived to that solution in the late 1980s, early 1990s. They realized that they cannot incarcerate, they have to be lenient on sentencing, and they have to invest in community. Uh, despite the fact that most people, I mean, public opinion in, 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 in Western Europe um, was against it, but, but uh, they still were able to push it. So Thank you, Marcelo. Rosemary, just, just to, to you to think about this, you know, we're hearing that these, there's these models in Western Europe. Uh, we're hearing that, that you could use the cost argument. You know, Charlene says this is all about capitalism. <laughs> Let me come back to it and say, okay, it's cheaper to have people out of the prison. You, you, you Rosemary, were talking about how the prisoners have such squalid and desperate conditions. They're relying on NGOs and, and families, you know, to, to give them even their basic needs. Um, what, 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 what needs to happen in Africa? What can change the, the dimensions, uh, uh, you know, in, in sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, we have done it with other chronic conditions like HIV. There's going to be a movement, a global movement uh, where people are really looking at the social determinants of health. Why are the inmates where they are? What are the risk factors on the ground? Why are they susceptible 
to being incarcerated. Because so long as uh, people are looking at the surface and not addressing the core problems that are driving people to committing crime, I think people will continue to go around in circles. And uh, for me, really, I think like what I've said, there's got to be a global movement, activism. Let's break those uh, walls that now actually become barriers to access to prisons. Within the African context, we have a problem that, you know, even getting into prisons itself is a problem when you want to do research. They are high security environments. I've been to prisons conducting research, but it's not a easy walk. You really have to satisfy, nothing wrong with looking after the ethics and the proper human research when you are, when you are doing research with our inmates, but also at times you find that, you know, our governments tend to shut out the public, public health practitioners as well. Like right now, we don't even know what the incidence of uh, COVID is, COVID-19 in prisons is. Because for you to be able to get in there, it's quite a protocol. You have to pass different offices. And until there's activism and we've broken those barriers that actually keep people in incarceration without looking at the real reasons why they are in that state, We'll continue to go around in circles, and we can come up with uh, 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 things like, you know, let's advocate for lesser sentences for petty crimes. But why did the petty crime happen in the first place? Poverty, economic mel yeah. meltdown. Yeah. And if so long as we are not addressing those inequalities, we'll continue to dance around the problem and advocate for lesser sentences, which to me really. Yes, it's a good uh, sort of advocacy point, but to me, the important and core thing is to get to the bottom of why are people being incarcerated? Why are they in those worlds? What can be done to lessen that burden? Because lesser crime and lesser incarceration also means, you know, they are efficient gains for the state. So for me, really, I think uh, the issue really will be to get to the bottom. Why are people being incarcerated? What are the driving forces? Yeah, this is a very important thing. Um, yeah, the root causes are, are rarely addressed. Bruce, you know, you've spent so much of your career um, organizing people. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking I've been to some countries that we probably wouldn't consider the paragons of democracy. And when I've gone into prisons to look at their TB situation, uh, coincidentally, a couple of times on voting day, they have voting booths in their prisons, inside the prisons, prisoners are voting. And I've said, oh, wow, the prisoners vote. And they've said, yeah, of course, why wouldn't the prisoners vote? And I guess, you know, my question to you, Bruce, is how do we change this? The same, like, you know, uh, Marcelo talks about how the politicians are being pushed in a certain direction. We have both Rosemary and Charlene saying that it's linked to conditions outside the prison, like, like, like poverty and certainly race and, and the legacy of slavery and, and many other things. Um, how, do, how do we change it? You know, you, you've been trying to organize people. What are you organizing them around? Like, what, what's the driver? What, what are we going to do? Locally and globally. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for putting this together. And, you know, and I really, I, I, you know, I need to, to, to pause for a moment just to, to lift up uh, what Charlene was saying around capitalism and, you know, and, and hearken people back to a, a, a kind of a hidden quote of history, but there was a, an industrialist, Jay Gould, one of the robber barons who once said that he could pay half the working class to kill the other half. And, you know, our capitalism post manufacturing uh, kind of has a, I will pay half the working class to lock up the other half. And it sort of only works with a racial component. It only works with this drug war myth. Right, and they target communities of color for drug use in a way that they don't target white communities. We know this; it's a fact, right? And so the, you know, the the prisons are built in rural America, in white America. Why? It's a jobs program, right? You can either work at the Walmart or work at the prison. And so there is a, a capitalist component that is really important. And to shut down a jobs program, if one were to look at it like that because you will see that if you try to shut down a prison 
folks lining up. These are good neighbors, good workers, good citizens, American flags, you know, like, you know, we need this prison or whatever. And they'll try to cloak it in very non-racist or very, you know, supportive ways or whatever. Uh, but ultimately, you're trying to take food out of somebody else's mouth. And whether you're a bank robber or a uh, or an employee of a upstanding institution like a bank, although I don't know if that's upstanding, but you know, either way, trying to take food out of somebody's mouth, it can be hard. And so the only way for us to really do it is to create a movement. And that is one thing that we've really been doing. And movements have always been led by directly impacted women, by directly impacted people. And so when you think of like the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, every movement throughout history has always been led by those impacted people. And so the folks that are not impacted, they need to think about how it is that they can you know, provide amplification, provide credibility, access to network. This right here is part of that. Um, you know, movements choose their own leaders. They're not installed. Uh, a lot of those, those leaders in this context are people who were convicted of violent crimes, like myself. People who went down the road of foster homes and, and, and homelessness and cycles of incarceration and poverty, like myself, uh, who then have to get out on extended periods of time and really are, you're in prison long enough to see the system to really work with enough people to understand like the real thing afoot. If you're only in prison for six, nine months, you can forget about it and move on, hopefully. But if you've been in prison for years on end for something serious, you become a pillar of that community quite oftentimes. And so for those of us who are leaders in this movement, many of us have been convicted of, of things that, that nobody would want uh, someone to be convicted of. So, uh, And I feel like the fact that three F-16 fighter jets just flew overhead as I'm talking about the problems of America really reinforces it. That was probably, what, maybe a billion dollars worth of war machine that just flew over my head. And the fact that we can't find the room to create a real restoration process, a real assimilation process, the real accountability in our communities that we want for our own children. My daughter who walked in on me, if she runs into troubled times, I want to find a system where there's help. I want her back. No matter what she does, I don't want her stacked like firewood and throwing away the key, right? And everyone yeah. who knows her would yeah. want the same. And so I think that what we need to do is create that movement, continue what we're doing, decriminalize all drugs immediately as one, one bit of that work, uh, but really think about how it is that, that folks around the country can think about the transformative uh, process of when a movement leader shows up versus a, a informative process of when a non-impacted person is able to share on this issue. Thank you, Bruce. So Bruce, Rosemary, Marcelo, Charlene, uh, this has been a really you know, interesting conversation. It's so hard to capture the incredible work you guys have done for so many years in, in an hour and a half, but thank you. Thank you for, for the beautiful answers and for the, for the thoughts of how we can work together to fix this. I'm gonna hand back to, to Daisy to, to lead us to closure. Daisy, please. Uh, thank you guys all so much. That was such a wonderful and like meaningful. And I think, you know, I found it so insightful and just re revealing um, nuances about this problem that I had not even considered before. So this was really great. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Professor Kasevji, for moderating this wonderful conversation. Um, so that concludes our first webinar of this series. Um, and be sure to follow um, HGHI or the Safford Center for Ethics on uh, information for the upcoming dates. And we are so grateful for everyone's time and thank you for all of our attendees for joining us. Um, so have a wonderful afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daisy. Thanks, everyone. Everybody.